Um, this is one of my favorite photographs from a volunteer time when I was uh, a cabin dad. So I have a multi-generational legacy of YMCA camping and volunteerism. My grandmother, uh, my mother, my uncle uh, have all been involved with YMCA camping. I was a camper at Dakota. Thank you, mom and dad. Um, I am the brother of a former camper, LIT and cabin leader. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I am the parent of a current LIT and facilities uh, summer staff member. Thank you, Justin and Connor. I am an annual two-week volunteer. Thank you to my wife for letting me go. I'm also a board member, committee member, president. I, I, I really do a lot. I have a day job, believe it or not. It pays the bills. I really believe this is my job. Now, my role as a historian, I have studied our Y archives going all the way back to the beginning. Um, and actually, in a case in my car are the meeting minutes from our very first meeting on December the 8th, 1913. And we can look at that, uh, look at that later. I've written a lot of articles, um, 100 years ago series, talking about the hurricane. Uh, we researched all the Dakotians who died in the Second World War. Um, and I also helped with our centennial time capsule. So that's me. Now for the one person who didn't raise their hand. Uh, if you don't know, Dakota, the Cheshire County YMCA or Cheshire YMCA, it's had a, a couple of different names throughout its time, was founded in 1913 and is now the Dakota YMCA. So we are independent from our very good friends uh, at the Keene Family Y, but we get lots of phone calls about what are the pool hours. Uh, and we don't know that half the time. We have a headquarters is on Lake Street uh, in North Swansea. Camp Dakota is on 500 acres of private property in Richmond. We're gonna talk all about it. Uh, summer camp runs uh, through late June through August, and we do lots of additional programming and rentals and weddings. And we are ACA accredited, and we take care of over a thousand campers plus staff each summer. And um, you can find us online, of course. We have a website and we have Facebook and Instagram and all those things those kids do. Now, how do we look at the history of an organization this old in hopefully 45 minutes to an hour, right? How do you do that? So I could literally have us here focused on a single year of our camp and we could talk about it for hours because there is a huge amount of history wrapped up into this organization and it's all quite fascinating, or at least I like to think so. But what I will tell you is that over the course of time, the only constant we've had is change. So tonight what we're gonna focus on is really key moments of change uh, that really led to several different transformations of our organization. And it's important to note that I'm simply going to talk tonight about Camp Dakota. It's important to note that the Cheshire YMCA, Cheshire County, Dakota Y have had other programs like heritage and American travel and uh, outdoor education, lots of different programs in the past. But tonight, we're just going to focus on camp. Otherwise, we'd be here all night. Now, you might think that this story starts like a summer camp, right? With woods and water and trunks and bunks, but no, it actually starts with a young man and his motorcycle. Uh, you can see this is Howard T. Ball, and Howard T. Ball was a dashing young man from Dartmouth College, and he was a devout Christian, and he really believed that young boys in this area were just getting into too much trouble, and they needed a little structure during the summer when school wasn't happening. So he drove his Indian motorcycle. We think it was an Indian. We know it was a motorcycle. And based on the descriptions we've had, there's really only one motorcycle uh, that would have uh, worked the way it was described at that time. He drove it around and it had two saddlebags. One had a baseball glove and a baseball and the other had a Bible. And he drove around and he met with all kinds of local leaders and lots of names that we would recognize from Cheshire County. And he convinced them that we needed to form a YMCA in order to provide summer programming. And it worked. He was very passionate. Now, it's not just a motorcycle, it's also a horse-drawn sleigh because uh, this is Harold Dickinson uh, here, and I'll explain who this is in a minute. And this sleigh is very important. And what's really interesting is we still have the sleigh. Oh, why a sleigh? We're talking about a summer camp. That's because we come to our first moment of historical change, the very first meeting. The Cheshire County YMCA is formed on December the 8th, uh, December the 8th 1913. But again, why a sleigh? Well, it was in the midst of a major winter storm. 
but they were determined to have their meeting. So Harold Dickinson down in Richmond busted out his sleigh, hooked up a horse to it and drove his horse-drawn sleigh all the way to our first meeting. Now, I don't know how much of this stuff is true or has become legend over time, but the family stuck to their guns and assured us that not only is that story true, but that the sleigh we currently have um, is the sleigh. So what you can see here are, are documents from that actual meeting. This is the cover. And again, this is actually in a case in my car right now. This is it. This is the first piece of paper we have. And those are the names of all the people from all the different towns that came together to form the Cheshire County YMCA. We come to our first or second significant moment, which is Camp Primitive. Now, a lot of people don't know that before Dakota, we had another camp, Camp Primitive. And I can assure you that Primitive is a very appropriate name. Um, these are actual photos of Camp Primitive. It was in the summer of 1914, and this was Howard T. Ball's first major mission that he really brought to our Y. It was located in the northwest corner of Swansea Lake in Swansea, New Hampshire, and it was really do it yourself camping at its finest. So Oscar Bourne, if you really squint your eyes, that's him right there. Um, he gave us access to the property and we brought these boys together. They had to take a train ride and a three mile hike uh, while carrying their bags to reach the site. We know that because it is pretty much the only thing they complained about. Um, it was a dollar a day. They had to bring all of their own gear uh, and dig their own latrines, there was nothing. When I say nothing, I mean literally, there was just tents, tables, boys, food, and fun. Um, and this actually is them at Camp Primitive, and there he is. There's our motorcycle man right there. That's Howard T. Ball. He's so dashing. It's true, they say it in the records. And you look at the picture and you can see it. There were 11 boys enrolled at first. Now. That number is very conflicting. I, the, it, the records at times kind of are confusing a little bit. There are different numbers. Sometimes it's hard to tell if they were counting volunteers and staff, but if you count most of the pictures, you get about 11 boys and it cost about a dollar per day. There was lots of swimming, hiking, campfire, sports, songs, Bibles, um, and a good time was had by all. Next big moment actually become Camp Dakota. So Primitive ran for a couple of summers. Uh, for a long time, we believed that there was no programming during the uh, World War I. That's actually not true. We've been able to determine that we never took a summer off until just recently, and we'll get to that later. And there actually was programming the whole time, but it was scaled down for a little while. But this is where we became Camp Dakota. In 1916, we went to Tolman Pond in uh, Nelson. Now this picture is not the greatest. We only have a couple of pictures of what Dakota looked like when it was on Tolman Pond. But I've been there, we've actually explored the site. We know right where this is. And what's really interesting about this picture is you can tell it was during volunteer day because there's a lady in a dress. And so we know when this picture was actually taken. Now, where did the name Dakota come from? Well, Elgin Jones, some of you may know that name, um, was one of the founders of our camp and one of the founders of our Y. And Elgin briefly lived with the Native Americans out West. Reportedly, it was the Sioux during his time at Dartmouth College. And just to give you a sense of time, he graduated from Dartmouth in 1884. Now, he was deeply struck by their culture and by the fact that they were so willing to accept and teach him and help him grow as a person. And he constantly remarked in the records that they were a very friendly people. So he took the letters of North Dakota, rearranged them a bit, added an H and Dakota means friendly to all. And that's where our name comes from. He borrowed a basic representation of a Sioux chief's profile image. You can see our original logo up there and Indian studies as it was called, would become a very important and popular part of our programming for decades to come. And I will show you a picture of Rosie Smith, one of our Indian study guides in just a little while. Now, Camp Dakota on Picnic Point uh, on, on Tolman Pond, that is where it all starts. So you can see these are the three pictures we have and we have these pictures uh, because 
Jeff Craig, who's sitting right over there, was smart enough at one point to send a bunch of our records off to the National Archives or the YMCA, and we were able to arc, uh, retrieve them recently, and this uh, piece of paper was among them. And it shows morning flag raising, swimming, which is an expansion of the picture you saw a minute ago, and morning Bible study. And this right here is Daniel Lawrence. Daniel Lawrence was uh, the second director of RY after Howard T. Ball. And that's about as good of a picture as we have of him. Not quite as good looking as Howard T. Ball. So this point, Dakota be starts to become recognized as the Dakota we know today. There are about 35 boys and leaders swelled to a whopping 50 people on visitor's day. There was not much more than tents, tables, a fire pit, a giant rock in the water. The giant rock is still there. I've actually stood on it. There were some various classes in swim instruction. And I thought it was interesting that there were special guest speakers during chapel on Sundays. We still do that. Evening program included mock trial, mock wedding. Not sure how that worked. Stunt night. I bet that was interesting. I hope nobody got hurt. Guarding the flag, treasure hunt, and something called bicycling through England. I, I'm not sure what that was. But what's interesting is boys could earn an honor emblem for their accomplishments at camp. And these days we call them CTs. And this, and I'll show these a little later again, represent my entire journey since 1983 at YMCA Camp Dakota. Now, big moment, okay? Everybody ready? It's gonna get very exciting. This is where the magic really starts to happen. The roots finally take hold because Camp Dakota comes to Richmond, New Hampshire in 1919. We assembled a uh, committee you can see Elgin, you can see Henry Brown, there's a Brown in the room, Harold Dickinson uh, from Richmond and Robert C. Woodward. And there were some other folks who helped uh, consult with this group and their charge was to find us a site. Now, what's funny is I've read the records. I'm pretty sure they didn't have to look very much. They knew exactly where they were going. Harold lived literally across the street from where our camp was. Um, they all knew the owner that had the land. And so my theory is, they didn't have to do too much work and they found the site pretty quickly. So at this point, a new Dakota very quickly takes shape. So we had 30 acres of wooded land with a quote, marvelous hemlock grove on a hill overlooking 30 acres of water that connects to the Tully Brook watershed. So if you've ever been to Royalston Falls, Royalston Falls is powered by Cass Pond at Camp Dakota. That's where that water comes from. The site had one permanent building. Uh, you can see one of them there. Uh, this is actually the other semi-permanent building that had no floor. And there was a small open space for play and a small but lovely beachfront. That's it. There was no electricity. There was only basic plumbing. And I don't even think we could call it that. It was a small tank with a hand pump. So that gives you a sense of what the plumbing was like. Um, there was a short dirt road that connected to Fitzwilliam Road. Um, and it was originally supposed to be a school for boys, but that program didn't work out, which was good for us. And it was perfect, as it says in the records, quote, for a first class camp. Now you can actually see Elgin right here. And if you look really, really closely, Elgin is standing underneath our first bell. And we still use bells every day, all day at camp. This here is a document shows the description of what camp was uh, uh, really describes the site. And it's really, really fun to go back and read these records. Now, big moment, March 16th, 1919, 6.45 PM. How do I know it's down to the minute? Because they were meticulous at recording all of this. We took a vote. The motion is made that Daniel Lawrence, countywide director, should lease 60 acres in Richmond for the summer of 1919 with an option to buy the plot for an amount not to exceed, hold on to your seats, $2,400. The vote was unanimous, the die was cast, the site was ours, and we have been there ever since. Because the following year, we purchased the property. Those are the actual deeds. Those are the actual documents. They are in a safe in our office at Lake Street. Please don't go near them. I will be very upset. <laughs> now, it was a new site, yes, but it was still very small and very rustic. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at one of the original waterfronts. You can see, uh, and for those on Zoom or in the lower left corner, I mean, it's rickety. It's literally just like a platform in the water. Uh, you can see some of the original tents. 
Uh, up here, they were uh, just had wood bases with canvas and they smelled horrible. This building was actually at the site. This is currently our office building, although it's shorter here, it was added to later. And that is one of our early buildings there. So very, very rustic. Okay, another big moment, here we go, 1921. The names I'm sure a lot of you recognize and have all been waiting to see at what point we drop this bomb, Oscar and Francis Elwell arrive. It is a tectonic shift. Everything at our camp changes. The Elwells and Oscar in particular truly were the definition of leadership. Everything they did was for the mission. It was never for the money although he was constantly negotiating a higher salary, so I don't know. <laughs> he was a hard-charging authoritarian leader. There's really no other way to put it. It was Oscar's way or the highway. That's not my words, those are his words, okay? And so he didn't delegate. He, he was involved in everything. Oscar knew everyone. And he was close with most of the local business leaders. So Kingsbury's toys that are out there. The Kingsburys were involved, the Brown family. Like I said, there's a Brown in the room here tonight, Ripley's, many others. If you were a local leader in Cheshire County, or even just a local family, Oscar knew you and you knew Oscar. And Oscar didn't ask you to donate money. Oscar told you, this is how the check you're going to write. They called it scheming Sundays. He and Harold Dickinson would sit on the porch and decide how they were going to do it. Now, nobody is perfect. And even the revered make mistakes, so it's, it's very simple. You either loved Oscar and Francis, or you didn't. There was no middle ground, and I've heard stories on both sides. More people love them, maybe out of legitimate love, maybe out of fear, but uh, there was no middle ground. But for the Elwells, Dakota was their life, and in some ways, it was the first and really only major career they ever actually had, because once they came, they didn't leave for a long time. We'll talk about that. Now, what's really fascinating to me is 100 years ago, uh, last summer, Francis really pushed hard for balanced programming for girls from the get-go. That was part of the deal that they had. They acted very much as a partnership. They were devout Christians, truly believed in our friendly to all motto, and were welcoming to anyone who wanted to come to camp. And I love these pictures because this one is grainy because there's so few pictures where they actually look young. Every other picture, they look older. And so you can see they're getting up there. And actually, there's one of our Indian studies guys right there. Okay, so Dakota in the early 20s after the Elwells get there, um, it really was still not much. But Oscar had the vision. He knew what he wanted to do, and he knew how he wanted to grow it. So there were just a few small buildings and tents, what is now called Camp Street. For Tacodians in the room, Camp Street was, if you're standing at the office and you're facing down the road that goes toward the waterfront, the upper part was Camp Street and the buildings were right there. That uh, road didn't turn left originally. That was when we built Memorial Lodge later. I'll talk about that. Um, there was no substantial plumbing or electricity, but some of the familiar tr traditions start to take hold. So the values, the songs, the classes, uh, things like CTs are all from the get-go start to take hold. We see international staff arrive. Uh, we see the property start to grow and change. Programs, people, fundraising, facilities. It all starts to ramp up very, very quickly. I, I don't think Oscar slept. I, I don't really know, but it definitely was a seven-day-a-week job for him. Now, it's a very different property from what we see today. Why? Pre-hurricane. So we'll get there too. And the thing that Oscar wrote in our records every year, and we see it constantly, and you'll hear me repeat it, was that every year had to be bigger and better. He said it every year, bigger and better. Girls camp in 1922. These are the actual first girls campers. These are the photos we took of that actual group. That's really them. So it was part of the deal, and it was never intended to be clear, to be some sort of finishing school, school or anything like that. It was the same camp experience. Where we offer the boys, we offer the girls with very minor differences. So it's very important to note that it was completely balanced from the get-go. It was very equal. And really that hasn't changed. A girls camp was extremely popular from the get-go and it still is today. So bigger and better. 
bigger and better. We start to build new cabins. The waterfront starts to take hold. That's the toadstool in the middle. It was where some of our first plumbing was. And I keep bringing that up because I want you to rebuild the toadstool, Sarah. <laughs> and that is our uh, dining hall. We now call it TPAC. It was built in 1928. And I love that picture of those boys going in. Okay. There is Uncle Oscar reading to a bunch of girls in Friendship Lodge. Um, that rug that is hanging over the fireplace was actually donated um, by one of our Indian Studies guys, and I wish we still had it. Camp Dakota in the late 20s, rapid development, right? We're building new cabins, new buildings. There's a huge amount of building going on because Oscar would get men, materials, money in any way he wanted. He just, he just barreled his way through our community and got what he needed. We start to see the introduction of utilities a water tower, a gas powered electrical generator, which later was in the same building as the showers. I, I don't know. There were popular staff members start to come back year after year. Oscar begins to be recognized as a leader and fundraising really kicks into high gear. You can see Oscar and Francis here. There's Oscar, there's Francis. These boys are, you know, you can see all the different camp and you can see it's really starting to take hold and actually look like a summer camp not just an encampment. Uh, there's Rosie Smith down in the lower left corner. She came from uh, Bacone College in Oklahoma. We had lots of other Native American studies instructors who came from around the country. But anyway, continued period of growth, right? So our kitchens become professionally run. Elsie Crown and Shield uh, comes, uh, arrives in 1935. The waterfront begins to grow. There's a dining hall addition put on. It's really starting to now actually look like the camp that we know today. And this is one of my favorite things. Campers actually did a huge amount of the work. They were voluntold. And, and I'm not joking. This is actually what they're called. It's in our records. They were called shut up and shovel gangs. <laughs> that is true. And we have pictures of boys just like hauling rocks out of the dirt and they are absolutely ecstatic and loving it. <laughs> it was all going so well. Everything was wonderful until, oh boy. Then the great New England hurricane comes and Dakota is totally transformed. It really is a tale of two Dakotas. It looks completely different. Do you remember a few minutes ago, I said when they first found the site, they talked about a marvelous hemlock grove. Gone. So two weeks prior to the storm, Oscar had commented to the board that the summer had been one for the record books in 1938. Dakota had its highest attendance. They benefited from lots of new activities. The weather was wonderful. And while we're sad to move out of the birches, that was their cottage, and we'll miss the sounds of children, Francis and I will be looking forward to next summer, which we hope will be, there it is, bigger and better. Well, no. So first of all, the storm slams into the region on September the 21st with a furious intensity. It smashes its way through New England and the damage to Dakota is done. It's bad. It's very bad. It was so bad that they actually had to have one of the Kingsburys flew over the camp in an open cockpit plane and help them spot different things because they couldn't tell where anything was. Camp was just destroyed. And you can see the damage there. Now, Oscar had a talent for identifying opportunity and chaos. It is not, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not putting him on a pedestal, although I guarantee we do that at times. What I'm saying here is that he had a choice. We are done or we pick this up and we get going again. I love this picture. I love this picture. Oscar is sitting at our waterfront. Look at the expression on his face. His camp that he has poured his life into is destroyed. And in the records, he actually says, out of this, we will find more room for sunshine and play. Think about that. Think about that in the midst of his, of his new career, of this wonderful new thing he's built and it's destroyed. He could have walked away. Nope, we'll find more room for sunshine and play. And last year I showed the boys during our candlelight ceremony, this photograph, and I said, everyone's gonna get hit with a hurricane in our lives in one way or another, you have to find more room for sunshine and play. Cleanup was initially estimated at 10,000, about 214 today, ended up way over 500,000. Buildings had to be removed, repaired, rebuilt. There was a massive amount of trees down. The whole lake was full of trees. It was a mess. And while camp was ready for opening day in 1939, and that's true, 
It took about 10 years before it really started to look normal. And even today, you can still see the signs. Okay. Um, this next slide is pretty important to me. So heroism and heartbreak, to Codians that are lost and not forgotten. Let me explain that and tell you a little bit about what you're looking at there. One of the most beloved buildings we have at camp is called Memorial Lodge. Memorial Lodge was dedicated on July the 28th, 1946, in honor of all Tacodians that had died up to that point. But there is a plaque in the middle, and that plaque bears the name of 12, 12 boys. One of them is a Kingsbury. It is all of the Tacodians who died in the Second World War. We found all of their stories, all of their pictures, all of their bios. You can actually see that on our website if you like. But this would become one of the most beloved and iconic locations at camp until they almost knocked it down accidentally 10 years later, but that's a story for another time. Now I'm gonna jump quickly here, okay? Because decades of significant land and facilities expansion followed, staff program development, the 50s and 60s, bigger and better, bigger and better. And now there were no hurricanes, right? Now they really were committed to growth and construction and program excellence. So it just kept growing. And then in 1971, the end of an era, the Elwells depart. And it took a little effort. Um, it's hard when somebody has poured their whole life, 50 years, a combined 100 years into something, and we have to gently ease them out the door. And that wasn't easy. So there was a lot of recognition. I love this picture of Uncle Oscar. Look at that. I mean, come on. That's just so <laughs> We had to get them to retire. And that wasn't easy. So what we did is we said, all of 1971, Oscar, all we want you to do is sit down and write the entire history of our camp. And that's where a lot of this comes from. Their impact on Dakota still rings today. People, programs, property, buildings, uh, out in the community, tradition, songs, fundraising. I mean, I was just talking with that young man back there about Oscar Elwell, right when he walked through the door, everybody still remembers him and we do too. There's a couple of people here wearing 10 or 20 year jackets that we get at camp, all comes from Oscar. Oscar actually came back a few more times to visit us at camp. And by the way, this young man is my brother and he's sitting right there. <laughs> Now, in 71, after the Elwells depart, we really get into a significant renaissance of camp. So it's a whole new ball game. But it's important to note traditions, values, uh, CTs, all of the things that make Dakota never went away. We still have all of that. But still, there's lots of things that have to change over time. Camping changes, kids change, everything just changes over time. So it's this constant drumbeat of activity for over 40 years. And look at this picture. I love this picture of a little camp band playing right outside the dining hall. I just love that. Look how much fun they're having. Now, Camp Dakota across the 70s and 80s, what we start to see are sweeping changes in leadership styles. Okay, now there's a lot of words on this screen because there was so much happening. So Fred Toot comes in, uh, Jeff Craig, who was sitting right, seating right over there, Lada Johnson, Bill Allen, who wanted to be here this evening, Kevin Curtis, Steve Russell, Bruce Holloway, who is, there's Bill Allen, there's Bruce Holloway, that's Kingfish. Oh, hey, Fred, I think that's, that's you, isn't it? Yeah, that's definitely you, sir. Um, you conveniently cut yourself out of that book. <laughs> yeah, if I scroll that picture to the right, I'm hanging and I'm the only one not wearing a camp shirt because I don't follow instructions. Uh, Robert Buffalo Bob Smith becomes our first year round resident on Dakota property. Buff actually served our wife from 75 until he passed away in 1985. He is a legend for us at Camp Dakota. Ken Kingfish Clacka, yes, a lot of us have awesome nicknames, uh, came from Springfield College. Uh, he was is an award-winning, championship-earning aquatics director um, who really advanced our safety programs and several key traditions, including candlelight and CT ceremonies when you get these. Um, when Kingfish retired, I wrote a letter on behalf of our Y and gave him a photograph of a little boy jumping into Cass Pond for the very first time he ever went to camp in 1983 and he's getting a swim test and the little boy was me. So I actually have a photograph of the first time I jumped into the pond. Again, thanks mom. We see the Hornet's Nest Day Camp developed by uh, Uncle Rusty, Bill Allen, and Dr. Donald Johnson, um, which Bill called me last night and reminded me I had to say that it's a stinger of a program. 
Okay. <laughs> Grown. Just kidding, Bill. I love you. And uh, he also contributed a lot of other program developments and improvements to our volunteerism and fundraising. So I assure you that even with this sweeping change in leadership and all of these amazing people coming in and taking the reins of our camp, that policy of bigger and better never, ever changed. Under the leadership of Uncle Jeff Craig, Hornet's Nest is further developed, along with lots of new programs starting to come into the fold. Soccer and tennis camps, mini camp, computer camp, equestrian programs, and I guarantee he could go on and on and it would be just as fascinating. Outdoor education program for local schools is also developed, tested and expanded by Mr. Hafer, Mike Hafer, excuse me, uh, David Dahl and William Parkman. And I just love these pictures. Now, any Tacodian who's been to camp, you know exactly what's going on in that picture. Now, Dakota across the 1990s and 2000s, a, a, again, there's a, a lot going on here. Oh, who, who's this right here? Oh, my God, there it is again. Yep. As soon as I found out you were going to be here, I changed a lot of the photos, Mike. <laughs> that excellence in leadership continues. Okay, so Robert DeJong, Jeff Craig, Bruce Holloway, names that you're recognizing now, Mike Kafer, Willie Tarian, and more, continue to advance our camp through these decades. So, and our legendary camp registrar, Marty Fisher, retires in 1993. After serving RY since 1946, the only job she ever had. She just turned 95 years old, and she is just as, let's just say, as Marty as ever. <laughs> She's quite the character, and we love her. Minicamp program continues to grow. Uh, Minicamp was for like the littlest kids that needed to get exposed to camp. So they would come for a week, see how it went. It was all volunteer driven because it was a lot of parents because it was parents that would really help get these kids ready for camp. Tough, tough program. I experienced it as a leader and it is hard to do. But the idea was you get them ready and have them return uh, for two week sessions or for a month like my parents would uh, let me do, which was wonderful. Family camp continues to grow, but a major focus of the 90s, see it right here, was the development of the Craig Dining Hall. And so, which greatly expanded meal production while providing a year round multi use uh, building space. We didn't have anything like this. And I remember the first time I saw the Craig Dining Hall because I remember my dining hall, which was hundreds of kids packed in and you're like eating like this because you have no room to eat, but we didn't care. We loved it. It was a million degrees and we sang songs and had a blast. And then they built this thing and it's huge and it's awesome. And somehow you still feel packed in, which is wonderful. And then we opened the building in 1999 um, and the Centennial Terrace, which now sticks off the back of it and is gorgeous, uh, was added to the rear of the building when we celebrated 100 years in 2016. Okay. This is another big, big, big moment. For those of you who know camp, it's boys in July, girls in August, right? Nope, not as of 2012, we become co-ed concurrent. I'll explain what that means. It took a little while to get it right. We built the North Village. You can actually see the ribbon cutting here. A couple of those people are in the room. North Camp gave us the ability to have boys and girls in camp at the exact same time, but they are never together. So it's all very carefully orchestrated. That doesn't mean three meals, that means six meals. That means multiple programs running simultaneously. That means pass through the woods, different times of swimming, different bells have to go off. It had to be carefully orchestrated and it was really tough to get it right. Um, but it enabled us to go co-ed concurrent, which was, a, was done not only in response to master plans and, and visions of our camp, bigger and better, but also because that's what the families wanted. Like my family, when I went to Dakota, my older sister, Heather, they would drop Jay and I off at Dakota and then take Heather up to Nellie Huckins. We had to be at these different camps. Didn't have to work that way anymore, but it wasn't easy. And the early pioneers loved to tell stories about those early days. Oh, and yes, I have a story. So my story is that we used to take this pontoon boat across to the other uh, waterfront and for those of you who have been on a pontoon boat, you kind of have to distribute your weight. Now, we just took like 15 adults and had them all stand in the front end. It's fine. And as soon as they put the throttle up, the boat just went right down. So we're little, the waves are coming back at us and we're all running to the back and trying to get the boat back up. And it was so exciting and ridiculous and we're fine. Nobody was hurt, but it was quite the little memory. And the point is, is that it was so different 
Now we don't really think of it as that different because it's it's been so long, but at that time it was so different that it was a real radical change. And so it actually became not only an essential program, but a preferential program. People love going to North Camp. We originally called it North Village, but only for a year. And so as we look to activate our master plan, fundraising in the coming years, more villages and new features could be built that will allow us to significantly increase registration and diversify our programmatic offerings and make use of a giant campus of which we only operationalized a small part of it. So we have all this land to work with. There's Ryan and Sarah. Okay, so Camp Dakota from 2013 to present. Two different executive directors uh, help improve our overall financial health and introduce new programs and new additions to the property and facilities. For example, you heard me talk about Harold Dickinson at one point um, after Harold's son passed away, we actually uh, got the property. The Dickinson house is now part of our heritage as well. So Scott Peckins and Artie Lang. And then we have new members of the senior leadership team, including Ryan Reed, advance our strategies and operations by bringing new camping, corporate, and mental health training experience to the table. And I tell Ryan all the time that I remember when I saw his resume. Uh, I was on a business trip. I worked for IBM. I was in Moscow and Russia. And I clearly remember seeing Ryan's resume, and we are so happy to have had him as part of our why, because it has been yet another one of these significant periods of change and renaissance. Camp Dakota celebrates its centennial in 2016. It's an event that otherwise now use as a shining example of how to gather and re-energize their alumni. It was amazing. We had fireworks. I, I was like, what? We didn't have fireworks in my day, but we had fireworks. It was great. And uh, so rentals are now expanded and rentals are expanded things like weddings because we had that dining hall, because we have Mem Lodge, because we have the Centennial Terrace. So as camp begin to grow and change, it opens up exciting new possibilities of the things that we can bring to the community. The division names are changed for the fourth, maybe fifth time in our history. And you may recognize these names, Buffalo, Buffalo Bob, Crown and Shield, Elsie Crown and Shield, the cook that came in 35. And Kingfisher, named for Kingfish, the aquatics director, and Marty Fisher, the registrar. Now, what I, what's really funny is that one of the early names of the divisions was um, the Indian Frontier and the Stockade. Okay. COVID-19 uh, forced us to endure our first ever, uh, ever recorded full summer closing. Uh, along with eliminating some other programs. And I remember the night that we took that vote, it was very, very difficult, although I understood what we were doing and that it made a difference to keep the kids safe. It was really hard because I know from my firsthand experience, I volunteer in a cabin every summer, how badly these kids need it. And, and quite frankly, how much the staff needs it. I sort of like to say that we're not just a friendship factory, we're also a leadership academy. And we are teaching people how to be great employees, how to go out into the world and be a great member of a community. And so that one summer closed, um, although we were able to absorb the financial hit of it, so to speak, um, it was tough. It was tough to come back from that. And we really still see the difference in our kids. Sarah Cunningham. Uh, becomes our first female camping services director in 2022, setting another huge moment of history for our camp, and we are very proud of that. And right now, we are in the midst of a search for a new executive director and CEO. So the adventure continues. And is Chris here? There he is. Chris, here. Come here. In that picture. You see yourself? Just want to make sure you see. Oh, who's that? Okay. Well, that's me. Uh, I don't know why I'm missing teeth and have a black eye. He might have something to do with it, but I'm not sure. But you can see I'm standing in front of the exact same uh, door. I, my belt is weird because apparently I still don't know how to dress myself. My mother probably dressed me. And uh, that is me at Dakota. So bigger and better, this notion of constant change, this notion of ensuring that we are giving back to the community, this notion of assuring excellence in programming, excellence in facilities, what it all boils down to is a heck of a lot of work. And as you experience the program here at the Historical Society throughout the summer, and you look at these pictures, and you learn about these different camps, and you see all these little things, what I want you to think about is the amount of work that goes into it. And I'm not just talking staff work. I'm talking about parents who have to get the kids ready, 
all the stuff you have to buy and pack. My mother would love to tell you stories about what it was like when my trunk came home and um, how much it takes to really run a facility of this size and importance. And it is an honor for us to be a part of Cheshire County. So the research never ends. If you have a correction, an edit, or an addition to this history, if you have some little camp story, I love camp stories, <laughs> reach out to me, let's set a time to talk. And it's not just that I love to hear stories, it's that I find I learn little things, buildings that were in a different place, a field that had a different name, a different song that we don't sing anymore, a class that was taught in Hobby Nook, all of these little things that happen. So if you have something like that, please let me know. And in the meantime, we can go on to a Q&A, I think. Is that right, Peter? Yeah. All right. Whew! I hope I did it. Right. Yes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Victoria Hawkins. I'm a second generation Dakotian. Wonderful. And I went to Camp Dakota in the early 1950s. And uh, at that point in time, I was not aware of any uh, um, international figures who were at the camp. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, what that signifies. Uh, and also um, the Native American teachers, I forget what yep. you called them, but that program also seemed to not exist in the early by the 1950s. Yep. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about that also. Sure, so great question about international staff. So if you go into the Craig Dining Hall these days and you look up, you will see there are flags that um, are all on our ceiling and it represents the different nations of all the different international staff. We had international staff going way back. And part of the reason is Oscar really believed in going out and finding the best. And he would travel to different camps. He would travel to all these camping associations. He would speak to people from, I mean, really all over and they would have internationals come. That a lot more of that took place later in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and it is still very much prevalent today. In fact, we still rely on a huge amount of international staff to run our operation. Um, and there are actually agencies now. I think there's one called, is it Camp America? Yeah. That, yeah, th th Mika! <laughs> Mika's one of our internationals. In what capacity though? What? Every capacity. Mm -hmm. So cabin leaders, mm -hmm. um, kitchen staff, program staff, mm -hmm. a senior leadership. So we had, we, uh, you know, we just had, uh, was it Fabrizio that just recently visited again, who was a tennis teacher, instructor, and cabin leader when I was there as a kid. So internationals have played a whole range of roles. And th there were, I mean, they go really far back. And the Native American you were asking about? Um, it's a bit of a tricky subject because it does get phased out later. But there was a lot. There was a lot of sort of Native American Indian studies that was a huge part of camping, and so all, some camps did it where they, it was their own interpretation. What Oscar chose to do was actually bring in Native Americans from uh, Bacone College, and there were two others, and I can't remember the name of them. Rosie Smith, who again, uh, no, this one's not touch screen, and I always forget that. You can see her. There she is, right here. Now, what's interesting is I talked to the staff at Bacone recently and I asked them like, what am I looking at here? And they said that this is interpretive and doesn't actually represent anything from the Sioux Nation or she was a uh, Cherokee. What she's wearing, wearing is not Cherokee. And so it was really hard for me to kind of come to terms with what I thought was legitimate study actually was more of an interpretive program. And it was very widespread. I mean, it was all over the place, especially in Northeast camps. And um, there were a couple of things that she did. There was a thing that she did called a Sioux Sun Ceremony. We have photographs of that has been authenticated as a real thing um, that she actually brought to us. But they came and taught all different classes and they were huge members of our community. They were not just sort of like trinkets. It was, they were absolute like legitimate staff members. And she came back year after year after year. They loved Rosie. And, and when was this program phased out? 
Um, I don't think that there were any, I have not found any uh, Indian studies to, or Indian lore teachers, they also called them after Rosie and Rosie came through about the late forties. I have not found anything after that, yeah. but there was, a, we had the logo for a long time. We have pictures of people doing things that could be interpreted in one way or another. And so it, while the, some of the traditions hung on for a long time, we didn't actually bring the teachers in anymore. So you were there in the 50s and probably wouldn't remember that. And that's why. And I don't remember international. That's fascinating to me. Yeah, because there were definitely internationals there. They're in the records going pretty far back, not all the way to the beginning. But that is interesting. Any other questions? All right. Is there anybody on Zoom who has a question? You can either message it in the chat or raise your hand with raise your hand with one of the actions on the side on the bar below uh, jenna do you see anyone in zoom at when ask a question all right so let's give them a moment to think of any questions and does anyone else here in person have a question there is a question online oh there's a question online it. so it looks like kath allen is asking is there a way to come look at 1940s photos my oldest brother talked about attending camp um, yes, so there are pictures that hang in Memorial Lodge. Actually, some of them are from the 40s. And we have reams and reams and reams of photographs going all the way back to the beginning. And so a lot of those books are available. We have a little alumni museum that's actually at Dakota. So you probably could work out a time to go. But honestly, Kav, if you emailed me a photo of what your oldest brother looked like when he was roughly that age, I can also map the, uh, match the faces. Um, I've just recently done that with um, two people. So we found a photograph of a guy named Richard Lane, um, who was a P-47 uh, Thunderbolt pilot in World War II. Um, and we are now matching his photographs to when he was a camper. And another one, uh, Darwin Tim Delano, who is the only recorded Dakotian I can find that passed away uh, during Vietnam. And we are gonna be getting ready. Uh, we just communicated with the family and have their permission to honor him on Memorial Day. And so what I will do is take faces of what these people looked like <laughs> roughly when they were at that age and map them to the photographs. And I have probably a close to 100% record of being able to match photos. So that's a great question. Is there anyone else here in person who'd like to raise their hand? You? Oh, she's going again. Go uh, All right, go. let's do it again. You can go twice if you want. Um, speaking of the kitchen and Elsie Crowninshield, who I, I remember Elsie, um, but I wonder also if uh, you have come across a woman named Jenny. I, she, both of them were, uh, I, I forget what they were called, but they, oversaw the kitchens at Northfield School for Girls, which yeah. is where I, so I knew them both from there. And it was, we called her Mrs. J at Northfield, but at, at Camp Dakota, she was referred to as Jenny. And I think she was in the kitchen for a, she, a very long time. She, she was. Yeah, and, and how about Charlie Plimpton? Oh, all the time. Yeah, Charlie it, Plimpton's all over our records. I think that, um, at least from, from my perspective, we campers really, I mean, we saw Uncle Oscar as the authority figure. Oh. But Charlie oh, yeah. Plimpton was the guy yeah. we all knew and loved. And we have he, great he photos really, of Charlie. Yeah, he was really, he and his wife were the ones who were really and truly amongst the campers. I'll tell you real quick, an interesting story about um, Elsie was, we knew she came from Northfield. And so I had recently been communicating with a donor and he, he was talking about wanting to do something in honor of his mother. And he knew that he didn't really know much about his mother's early life. He knew she had gone to some school in Western Massachusetts. And he knew um, that she had gone to our camp, but he just didn't know a lot. And he had never seen any photographs of his mother when she was younger. They didn't have any. And so I asked, well, what was her name? And he said, Elsie. And I thought, Elsie? How many Elsies can there be in the world? And then I started thinking about Elsie Cronenshield came from Northfield. This man's mother came from a school in, he said, Western Massachusetts, called the archives over at Northfield, figured out Elsie Putnam was in a house with Elsie Crowninshield and brought Elsie Crowninshield because they became friends to Camp Dakota. So then we pulled the records, found the yearbooks, found a picture of his mother, 
who went by the name Putty. None of them ever knew that. And he was able to see a photograph of his mother when she was young. And we found out how we got Elsie Cromenshield. <laughs> so it's, history is just all around us all the time. Oh, and you know, Mrs. J, Jenny, she was a professional whistler. She whistled on the radio. <laughs> and she whistled for us at home squares. I'm going to have to look for that. We were laughing. We were, we were not nice girls that day. No, well, that's okay. But we loved her dearly. We did. It's okay that you were not nice girls. Hafer can tell you what I was like as a cabin, as a camper, and I assure you it's it's not a pretty story. So um, thank you for joining. Are there any other questions? Oh, right there. I know this is about Camp Dakota, and I did go there, and I also was a counselor in the in 1972, just after Fred. I know this. Is this on? Yep, it's on. Okay. Yep, you're good. Uh, I know this is about Camp Dakota, and I did go there as a camper in 64. Three and sixty-four, as short-term camp, which is a vestige of the past, yep. I think. Um, and then I went as a counselor when Fred Fred Toot had just begun his uh, leadership of the camp. But there were also a lot of other really great programs, and you did sort of allude to them. There was the New Hampshire Older Boys Conference that the Y participated in with other YMCA's, and there was also the New Hampshire Youth and Government Program yep. that was at the State House, which Cheshire County Y yep. did a lot. And that then there us, were yep. the American Heritage Tours. Travel, and all the, oh, yeah, the travel tours all through Boston and DC and all yeah. of that. Does that Wonderful still program. go on? That's my question. No. So, unfortunately, COVID took that down. Um, and we are talking about what the future holds. It's really hard when something goes down, it has a tendency to stay down. And so that was all volunteer driven, um, a, a lot of it was. So we experienced what a lot of other organizations experienced. We had to trim staff, we had to trim programs, we had to focus on keeping Dakota, the property, the program, the finances, the people, had to, we had to make sure that that is what made it through. Um, I don't know what the future holds for that, but I won't be surprised if that start, stuff starts to come back because those programs are really know your government, right? Like it's really important um, for uh, students to be able to have access to those programs. And it wasn't just the the Dakota Wise programs. There were lots of other travel programs around, and not just New Hampshire, around New England um, that unfortunately didn't didn't make it. In fact, one my son was supposed to participate in was one of them. The New Hampshire Youth and Government Program was fantastic because we actually went to the state house and I remember Walter Peterson was the governor at that time and we sat in his office. We elected a governor, he advised the governor. Uh, Jim O'Neill from Chesterfield was the speaker of the house. Uh, oh, that's fun. Jim from Keene High was the governor when Walter Peterson, it was a fabulous experience. And we, we lived there for two days, not lived in the state house, but we, we were there for two days. Um, one of my committee members was Annie McLean Custer, who's now our, our, our state representative. So those programs were wonderful ways to learn about how government functions. And we introduced bills and we passed marijuana laws in the 1970s. <laughs> so it was a quite a quite a different time. So you see, that's why these stories are important because you're 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 dropping some names. Some of those are familiar, some of those aren't, but I had no idea that some of those programs did things like that. Unfortunately, a lot of those programs aren't documented anywhere near as well as Dakota is. Right. So I actually don't know as much as I love to call myself a historian of this why, which is completely self-imposed term, by the way. Um, <laughs> I don't know enough about the, the travel programs. I spent a lot of time talking to Bill Allen about them. Yeah, and I was... do understand what the structure was and how it worked and when it when it worked. But we've lost a lot of that history. And so those stories are so important. So thank you for right. sharing that. I noticed that you, you're looking for an executive director. We are. Can you tell us something about your board? Uh, how many on the board? Yeah. How long you serve and where they come from? Are the ex-campers? Yep, that's a that's a great question. So we are in the midst of a search for a new executive director, um, which the Y also refers to as chief executive officer. Um, so you may see those terms interchanged a bit. Um, 
you know, when you're looking for, this is not a quick process. And so as president, I'm actually the head of that committee. And I have committed to our why and to this community that I will focus on doing it right, not doing it right now. So we will take our time. We probably will not have a person in that seat until around Thanksgiving or so. And that is because we are lucky enough to have that man right there, our interim director, Jim Doremus, um, who came to us from the Concord Y, is helping us keep our operation up and running along with Ryan and Sarah and the rest of the staff. But the board, the board's really where the magic happens. <laughs> I'm sure Ryan will tell you that's true. Um, so our board of directors, uh, they are people that come from all over. It used to be people almost entirely comprised of this region, and we still have a focus on really needing to have people in this area. So in fact, we actually just elevated a person from a committee um, who lives in the area, and she will actually start to get trained to be our treasurer. Um, but our board members come from all over. We have people from Connecticut, New Jersey. I'm from Lemonster, Massachusetts. Um, and they come from all over. We actually meet on Zoom and in Lake Street. Um, so what we look for when we are bringing new board members on is we produce what's called a gap analysis. And it allows us to look at who do we have, what skills do we have, and what skills do we need? So it's no longer like, oh, um, I know Ryan and Ryan's cool. Let's bring Ryan onto the board. Right. And it probably never really worked that way. But a lot of times it was who do you know and those people come on. Right. And so the, a lot of those times those were local business leaders. But the, the nature of business in the United States and certainly in New England has also changed. The banks are all owned by, you know, big box retailers are all owned by bigger companies. So we had to kind of look outside of the area to bring in people that gave us skills in things like law, health, construction, um, financial management, mental health, uh, you know, LGBTQ, all of those things that now, especially mental health, it's such a huge challenge for campers and staff, and definitely post COVID. So we have to look for people that have those skills. So um, board members come from all over. They, we do have term limits. In fact, I'm up in 2026. Um, we, we elect officers every year. We function, in fact, very similar to the way in which we, our annual meeting comes up in June, and it sounds very similar. Um, we meet on a monthly basis. Our committees meet very frequently, and it's probably exactly the structure you would, would recognize from something that would happen here. How many board members? Uh, we have, can have up to 15 right now. We have nine. Ten, because I just realized somebody rolled off and another one rolled in. But we can have up to 15. And so if somebody goes, we can fill that immediately. If it's net new, we have to wait till annual meeting. So another thing we're doing right now is looking at our bylaws because they haven't been updated since 2017, and it's time to update them. Hey, Graham, before we go, if you got time for one more question, I have one for you. Let's hear it. Why do you think it's important to learn about the histories of summer camps? Um, I think it's important to learn about the histories of summer camps for a couple of reasons. First of all, it is a overwhelmingly American story. Um, now, there are summer camps around the world, but and I mean, my parents and my grandmother and everybody all went to summer camps in Canada. But the traditions that we have here, and if you look at things like, like this, and a, a lot of our stuff comes from different Christian camps, comes from different um, Boy Scout camps. So we have an amalgamation of traditions that really come from across the United States. So there's sort of the American aspect of it from a history standpoint. More importantly, it's what it means for kids. What has it done for kids over time? And it's like I said about our camp, it's a friendship factory, right? Some of my best friends in my whole life come from Dakota. But it's also, what have we done to instill leadership lessons and prepare staff to be better employees, help them understand how do you serve a community? So if I really think about it, I think about it as that, that impact on forming relationships and learning how to be a leader in a community where the only other way you could really get that were other structured programs like school or church. And so it was something very different. And then of course, just the rustic nature of it now more than ever. You know what we gotta get kids away from? We don't have these at camp, although I get in trouble because I carry mine sometimes. 
<laughs> but we don't, there's, we're still very rustic by design, right? So there's no sort of glamour camping or glamping at Dakota, right? We're still, Hobby Nook functions the same way it always did. Our waterfront functions the same way it always did. It's a lot of those things are very similar. And that stability is the last point that I would come to, is you want people to experience something that if they come back, it's stable, because so many kids don't have a stable home. And when they come to Dakota, that sense of stability is there. And then of course, for somebody who comes back to Dakota many, many years later, um, it still looks and feels the same. And that is a very special thing that I find is rapidly fading in our lives. And I'm very appreciative that we still have it at camp. That was a great question. Does anyone else here have any more questions for Graham? Whew. Oh. Do you have any questions sent to you on Zoom? Thank you.